Welcome to Foresight Friday Roundup, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Friday, August 13th. Have you bought your school supplies yet? On today's episode of the Roundup, we're going to talk about venture capital and private equity funding of digital health technologies. Specifically, we're going to talk about trends in funding and digital health tech that we saw during the first half of this year and what those trends signal for the rest of the year and on into 2022. To tell us where the arrows are pointing are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? This is my favorite time of year to eat with all the corn on the cob, fresh blueberries and tomatoes, grilled vegetables. So I'm feeling hungry. (laughs) That's great. Julie, how about you? Well, global warming has definitely arrived in Seattle. And I know it's been 16 years since I lived here, but I don't ever remember this much sustained heat. It has been hot, hot, hot. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I have to keep my vegetable garden pretty watered here. So Dave, we can produce all those cucumbers and zucchinis for you, right? (laughs) Right. Before we talk about the latest digital health trends, let's talk about your use of digital health tech. Dave, I know you wear an Apple Watch and I know you keep a close eye on your movement, exercise and standing rings. Have you added or used any other health apps on your watch? I'm a total Apple head, as you mentioned, and I use lots of the watches functionality for health and wellness activity. The heart monitor, which, by the way, is incredible, sleep measurement, deep breathing app, and so on. I also use another app, which some people may not have heard about, called Fujicate. That's educate with food. (laughs) That creates any food for its nutritional value. You can scan in the UPC code or type it in, and you get a full reading. It's just pretty amazing to me how much knowledge is immediately at our fingertips for anything we want to know about our health and wellness. Thanks, Dave. Julie, have you broadened your use of digital health tech in any way? I can't say that I've broadened it since the things I've mentioned in the past, but what's been most effective for me lately are the hard numbers. And my Verta app has my scale integrated and my blood glucose is monitored through that. And those numbers do not lie. You can't cheat. So whatever you're using out there, just start measuring and watching those trends over time. They're sobering. Got it. Thanks, Julie. How does it do your blood glucose? That's interesting. Well, I have to do it, but there's a Bluetooth capability that sends it straight to the app. Oh, okay. I mean, I wish I just did it by my looking at myself, but. (laughs) You know, I'm not surprised by anything anymore, right? I would scan my forehead and know my blood glucose. uh, Who knows? I'm ready for that. Well, I'm a little bit behind you guys, but you would be proud to know that I did have my first telemedicine visit. And guess what? It was a phone call (laughs) and the doctor was five minutes late. So I guess (laughs) some things never change. Uh, All right. Let's talk about the latest digital health technology trends. I'll give you some highlights of some research here. In its mid-year report, Rock Health said VC funding of digital health hit a record $14.7 billion through the first six months of this year, and that topped the $14.6 billion in funding in all of 2020. And in its mid-year report, the Mercom Capital Group said global VC funding of digital health hit a record $15 billion through the first six months of the year, more than double the $6.3 billion recorded during the same period last year. And Startup Health reported $20.1 billion in global health innovation funding through the first six months of the year. Again, more than double the $9.7 billion recorded during the same period last year. Dave, what the hell's going on? What do these reports and others say to you about the direction of the healthcare industry? Amazing numbers, right? Just amazing numbers. Reminds me of the song for the love of money by the OJs. Money, 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 money. Remember that one? I do. <laughs> yeah, they must use the word money 25 times at the start of that song. But that song makes the point that there's gold in them, our digital tech investments. The obvious observation is that investors see enormous opportunity in digital healthcare broadly and consumer health in particular. 
there's some technical things going on as well. Interest rates remain low, and there's lots of cash sloshing around. So that's driving the overall market higher. Healthcare IPOs and acquisitions are additional factors driving valuations up in the sector. But it's just hard to ignore the enormous amount of funding flowing into the innovation sector in healthcare. Companies targeting just about any health or healthcare-related activity are receiving abundant funding. We'll get into the specific companies and sectors in the second half of our program today. But an interesting question emerges from all this dramatic uptake in health innovation funding. Is it a tipping point? And I think the answer is yes, we're at a tipping point. There is so much funding going into digital health and healthcare that promising companies are getting all the resources they need to succeed. And many companies are achieving attributable positive outcomes that create value for customers. Just think of what Verda is doing for Julie. All this investment activity is part of the reason I believe that healthcare will change more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100 years. Got it, Dave. Thank you. Julie, where is the money flowing? What digital health tech is attracting the most attention and why? And does that mirror what you're seeing in the market? Well, get comfy because I took three lenses on where money's flowing. <laughs> Clinical indicators, technology categories, and geography. And not surprisingly, money is flowing into the highest cost areas or frankly cost drivers of clinical care. And Rock Health reported that these categories are mental health, cardiovascular, diabetes, the top three. But I was most interested in seeing substance abuse finally hitting the top five, thanks to paratherapeutics and groups and others. And seeing both mental health and substance abuse in the top five, I frankly think is a statement about the power of virtual to really provide access in ways that we haven't been able to before and frankly starting to reduce stigma around these issues, which is fantastic. Also, one of the most notable and largest single rounds in the U.S. in digital history was Noom with $540 million raise. And for those not familiar with Noom, it's focused on weight loss. So another demonstration of focusing on the drivers of cost as opposed to the care itself. And on the other hand, oncology investments actually dropped from third to sixth place, and that you know, supports the thesis. On the technology category lens, the Maricom report noted that almost $4.2 billion went to telemedicine, $1.7 to wellness, $1.6 to mHealth apps, $1.5 billion to analytics, and then $1.1 billion to clinical decision support. So again, it seems like the more care-oriented technology tools may be falling a little bit. And finally, I found geographic the most interesting, the biggest deal was not a U.S. deal, CMR Surgical in the U.K., I believe, $600 million raise. But back at home, of course, we had the usual suspects, San Francisco, New York, Boston-based companies top of the list, but we're seeing some newcomers from places like Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, and Austin, Texas. And Austin racked up 13 deals in the first half of 2021, which is pretty incredible. And honestly, this is super consistent with what I see, you know, both smart money and big money putting to work across the investment community, even to the point where we're frankly starting to see more D2C companies again, many of whom are dabbling with the dual track enterprise, which is why we see them. But that's another wave of D2C, which is why I think Dave might be right. We're at a tipping point. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Dave, anything to add to Julie's comments? I'd like to add an observation about big tech and telemedicine. Mm -hmm. The big move into healthcare by Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are part of their epic battle to win the cloud wars where so much of their profit originates. And as Julia said a few times before on the show, these companies need to be in healthcare for no other reason than the sector is so large that they need to be in it to sustain high earnings and their market valuations. So through Amazon Care, Amazon is emerging as a competitive threat to health systems for the provision of virtual care, and they're playing for keeps. Inside health systems, Epic is making a play to become the primary portal for virtual care based on the predominance of its EMR software. Microsoft, through its Teams and Office products, is the preferred health system vendor for internal virtual connectivity. They would also like to become the health system's partner of choice in virtual care. So who would you bet on, Epic or Microsoft? At the same time, there are numerous telemedicine companies clogging up the space. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see Microsoft acquire Teladoc 
or another major telemedicine provider to eliminate some market confusion and solidify its competitive advantage with health systems. Really interesting times. All right, Dave, uh, you heard it here first, right? Good prediction. Now, given what we've seen so far this year and what's happening with the pandemic and population health, what do you see happening the rest of the year and on into 2022? Julie, can we keep up this pace? Will we see a shakeout? Will we see a change in priorities? Well, you've heard me tell the story before, but this is not necessarily a trend from out of the blue. I mean, before 2004, healthcare was effectively all paper. So what we're really seeing is this crazy ability for us to actually do things now that we have digital data. And the pandemic you know, dramatically changed this for us by giving us real scaled use cases for, frankly, you know, some the first time. But as Dave sort of alluded to, that's only part of the story. And this, this macro increase in value of all asset classes, considering how cheap money is, is a huge driver. So I keep pondering, you know, what's going to happen when or maybe if, considering how things are trending globally, inflation hits and how that affect the digital health sector overall, considering how much money has come into healthcare given the health of other industries, and which adoption trends will have made enough progress and have staying power through any kind of downturn versus what's a little bit too nascent. And what we saw in the first half of 21, you know, it wasn't necessarily the volume of deals that was so incredible or notable. It was really the size of the deals. And as Startup Health noted, you know, deals of this size will change the landscape forever and honestly redefine what's possible in healthcare. And that's largely because you're seeing companies take so much money that, to Dave's point, they can gobble up other companies in a way that really creates a much larger entity reduces confusion in the market, streamlines packaging of products in the market. So I think we're definitely at one of those places where that will start to happen a bit. And the diversity of companies we're seeing come through is what excites me the most. But some of these companies are getting very, very niche. And you're seeing huge valuations placed on companies, even that are focused on very niche mental health issues that are very severe. And will those have staying power? I don't know. You know, we're in very early innings here, um, and I do think we might start to see a bit of a slowdown in the second half of 2021. But the question is how far we get with the consumer and enterprise adoption before this kind of macro picture shifts. Got it. Thanks, Julie. Dave, will the digital health tech bubble burst or will it keep getting bigger? You mentioned you think we're at a tipping point. What policy or market variables will affect what happens next? Well, as Julie described in the first part of the program, like her, I'm struck by just the sheer amount of investment going into direct-to-consumer health in all forms, weight loss, exercise, mental health, sexual health, home health, care navigation, drug delivery, and so on. The scope of the service need, because we are shifting from a paper world to a digital world, is breathtaking. And the market seems intent on finding workable solutions. I don't know if he can keep up the pace, you know, more than doubling this six months versus the previous six months. But I don't see it slowing down too much in the next six months. Uh, but the bubble question you raised is really quite interesting. I had this discussion about whether or not there's a bubble in the healthcare tech marketplace with my great friend, Dave Crane. If you don't know Dave, he founded Medcap in his basement in Charlotte and built that into what it became. He also took over National Surgical Hospitals and built that into a very successful company. He's an incredible operator, team builder, leader, and he also happens to be a pretty savvy investor in the health tech space. And he thinks we're reliving the dot-com boom from the late 90s, that current valuations aren't sustainable and like Julie was saying with her observations about the niche nature of some of these companies and just the sheer scope of some of these valuations, I don't entirely disagree with Dave, but the difference between now and the late 90s is that some of these companies will break through and redefine the healthcare industry. Healthcare delivery is so inefficient and over-directed toward treatment that it creates enormous opportunities for companies 
that can bring the right balance, can achieve the right balance between activity and outcome without breaking the bank. Are some company valuations too high? Absolutely. Are all company valuations too high, like they were in the dot-com era? Absolutely not. The trick, of course, is knowing which is which. Thanks, Dave. Now, I've done a lot of things in my basement, and somehow I'm still in it, so I should talk to your friend. All right, Julie, anything to add to Dave's comments? You know, the only thing I double down on, Dave, I'm sure you saw some of this, but globally, this activity is happening just as much as at home. There's a French-based company called Allen that's given a major pop to the insurance tech industry. Pharmacy tech is up in India. Telemedicine in Europe just basically moved to a huge next level with a company called Cry big deal in Canada that's raising capital for U.S. expansion in home care. So the activity is not just U.S. based and globalization is happening now and wasn't something that we could actually have achieved maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, I think this is interesting in the sense that we are starting to really see global movement in health tech. Thanks, Julie. It may be time to get an Apple Watch. I'll start watching my rings just like you, Dave. We'll see. (laughs) Just goes to show that healthcare is broken all over the world. So tech is here to save the day, just like the Avengers. Right. Love the superhero references. All right. Now, as always on the Roundup, let's talk about next week. Julie, what's making healthcare headlines the week of August 16th? I think vaccines continue to be uh, huge in the headlines. And we're hoping for many new ways to think about boosters and kids and um, all sorts of solutions to really get us out of this morass. Thanks, Julie. Dave, what's the big story of the week of August 16th? My video debate with Jerry Friedman, Bernie Sanders economist on single-payer health care is now out and available for viewing. Jerry and I are both for universal health insurance. He's for single-payer. I'm for doing it in a pluralistic way. So I hope everybody's talking about that. Yeah, Medicare for all. Yes or no. All right. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. You also can find a recording of this podcast and all our podcasts on the Healthcare Now Radio Network, iTunes, Spotify, and other streaming services. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.